Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 244. Haha. <laughs> My background are acting, film production, directing, and I've studied them for many years. Keep in mind that you need many skills when you are starting any film project related to real life. Tommy was so. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Unknown is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post-sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley, ADR, and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post-sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. You guys are tearing me apart! I'm sorry, guys. This is going to be a special episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. I am, as you guys know, I am a fanatical fan of Tommy Wiseau's cinematic masterpiece, The Room. And I had the absolute pleasure of meeting one of the actresses that worked in The Room, Robin Paris, who was Michelle in The Room. And I met her at Sundance and really just started geeking and fanboying out with her and started asking her all sorts of questions about The Room, about Tommy, about you know how much the disaster artist was real, all sorts of stuff. And I said, you know what? You just got to come on the show. You've got to come on the show. I want to talk to you about the show. And then she also told me that she's now a filmmaker and she's been a filmmaker for a while. And she created a series, a mockumentary series called The Room Actors, Where Are They Now? And it's an extremely funny series. She's gotten four episodes done already. And she takes all the original cast or most of the original cast of The Room and just does really fun mockumentary stuff with it. They launched on Funny or Die and on YouTube and the reaction was insane it went kind of crazy so they have i think 10 or 12 episodes are trying to get made and they have a current kickstarter going on right now which i will leave in the show notes at indiefilmhustle.com forward slash 244 but we really just got into all sorts of fun talk about the room about film production what she saw behind the scenes of how the worst movie ever made got made uh and the truth behind it because she was there firsthand uh, it's it, it's educational, it's funny, it's entertaining, it's a really fun episode, guys. And you know I generally don't bring anybody on the show unless there's some value for you guys, but this is a, an episode that is not only valuable because you get the behind the scenes of the worst movie ever made, but it's also just so fun to listen to. And if you are a fan of The Room, sit back and enjoy some really juicy information about how this movie was made. If you guys watch The Disaster Artist and are a fan of that movie, you will definitely enjoy this episode. And then we also talk about her filmmaking and how she's making it as a director and moving forward in her career after The Room and, and how you deal with being in the worst movie ever made. And if, by the way, if you guys have not seen The Room, um, you got to get a group of friends over and watch The Room. You just have to do it. Like while I was shooting on the corner of Ego and Desire, it just started coming up. The room just kept coming up because the disaster artist was hot at the time and uh, during award season. And I literally, one of the nights that we were shooting, I just grabbed everybody together and we rented the room and watched it, the whole crew. And I was the only one who had seen it before. And it was just so amazingly fun to watch. It is so bad 
that it, it, it it's kind of like a, a star imploding on itself and turning into a supernova of, of, of just awesomeness. It is so, so good. It's so bad. It's so good. Uh, I can't I can't ex- I can't explain it anymore. You just have to experience it. But if you want to get a little bit about how this this thing was made, uh, please enjoy my conversation with Robin Paris. I would like to welcome to the show Robin Paris. Thank you so much for being on the show, Robin. Oh, thank you for having me, Alex. It was it's been a, it's a it's a joy. It's a pleasure. I'm giddy to have you <laughs> on and talk about. Uh, talk about a project I'm sure you're you're tired of talking about by this point in your life. <laughs> well, I know I can't escape it, so I might as well embrace it and have fun with it. You know, it, 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 for everybody who's who's isn't aware, um, anyone who's listened to this podcast knows that I am a, a raving The Room fan. I am fascinated with the movie, and uh, Robin and I met at uh, Sundance uh, this this year. And uh, we um, actually, Robin is in uh, the movie a little bit. If you want to talk a little bit about about um, our movie, the one we we did together, we could talk a little bit about that before we jump into the room. Uh, sure, we're we're shooting the the um, uh, the party scene, and lo and behold, <laughs> Robin is there, and my producer comes like. Robin Paris, the actress from the room is here. She wants to be in your movie. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no, she's not. There's no possible way that that she actually is here. And he's like, no, she is. There she is. I'm like, oh my god, we have to write a scene for her right now and put her in the movie if she wants to be in the movie. So how did you? What was from your perspective? Because I've been talk, I talked to because that that whole movie on the edge of and for everyone who doesn't know, it's on the corner of ego and desire. Uh, my new film. That's such a blur to me, the whole process, because uh, it was yeah. done so quickly. From your perspective, how did you get introduced to the film? How did you say, hey, I'll be in it? How, and the whole experience. So from your perspective, I just want to know how you felt about it and how you got into it, first of all. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of a blur for me, too, <laughs> because it's like it was like 1 a.m. It was. Or late, it was 1 a.m. at Sundance, right? <laughs> and we were at a party. It's Sundance. And I was just talking to a few people and they were saying that you were doing this film and that you were in the next room shooting some scenes. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And then somebody mentioned that somebody on your – you guys had recently seen The Room the night before. We literally – the, the whole crew <laughs> sat down and saw The Room. I was the only one who had seen it before. And the experience was as you can imagine. Yes. I mean, yes, I get it. I love the room like a fan. I, lo- I love seeing it. It's so crazy. It's so funny. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, so they mentioned you guys were doing, you had just seen the room and that there had been a scene um, in your movie where one of the main characters talked about how the room was his favorite movie. Mm-hmm. And that, oh, somebody said, oh, wouldn't it be funny if you were in, in this movie and you like just showed up? And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. I'd be happy to do that. Just let me know what you want me to do. Right. I'm just here dancing, having a few drinks. So if you need me to be in the movie. <laughs> and um, next thing I know, they went and I think they talked to you. Uh-huh. Then, I, then I talked to you. And then like about 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, I was we were shooting the scene, I think. <laughs> Some, some like th- that. It seemed it seemed like that. I think it was. I think it even was a little bit more than fifteen or twenty minutes. Because from okay. the moment <laughs> that they said that you were uh, you wanted to be in the movie to the point when we got to you, it's probably an hour. Okay, uh, be- it was just because we were shooting the like you know one of the biggest scenes of the movie, <laughs> and it was yeah, and we were battling drunks, and it was like you know trying to get them out of the shots, and it was insane. It was. I don't know how you did it. I'm amazed <laughs> that you shot that movie in the middle of that party because it was really loud. There was a lot of dancing, yeah. a lot like tons of drunks. <laughs> it was tons of drunks. I was battling off a drunk, drunk actors that I would recognize who will remain nameless. Um, other people in the industry that were just, you know, Hey man, you're making a movie. I was like, it was just, it was, <laughs> it was insane. Uh, and I had no security to block everything off. So I was just trying to, you know, the funniest thing is that we were shooting one of the scenes and literally as I yelled action, I turned around and there must've been 20 people with iPhones recording it. And I'm really? think and I'm thinking to myself, you guys are all industry. Are you kidding? You've never been on a set before, let alone a set with like three people. It's not like a ma- we're not on the set of <laughs> Avengers. <laughs> you know, like, this is not that impressive, guys. I don't understand. But one thirty in the morning when you're drunk and you see a camera and some lights, apparently everyone goes crazy. That's uh, right. It's Sundance. Uh, and then, it's there. And we shot our scene in in I think five minutes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep, I believe it was two takes yep. max. Yep. And five minutes. It was two takes. You did fantastic. And a good friend of ours, Sebastian, played your agent. That's right. And I had just met him the night, the day before. Right. I knew him, at least. That yes. was fun. But that was, <laughs> but that was a, and then that was it. And then you were gone and I was gone. <laughs> that's right. You we were gone. Yep. Next morning I was like, oh, that's so funny. I was in a movie last night. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said. My mates were like, what? Like, yeah, yeah. I was in a feature last night. <laughs> yeah. I shot some scenes for a movie last night at a party at Sundance. And every, you know, you're not the only one. RB, who who also plays a part uh, in the movie, uh, RB Bato, he had the exact same yeah. thing. He was in another party and he actually uh, kept telling me, I got to go. I got to go shoot a movie. And they're like, you've got a screening? What? Like no one understood. <laughs> Like right. he was like, no, I'm actually in a movie. <laughs> what? Like no one, no one got it. And then I send you the trailer, and you're like, oh my god, it's a real movie. <laughs> it looks so good. <laughs> it, I, I am so blown away that you shot that in 36 hours. It was, I can't even believe it. It was done quickly, without question. It was an experience. So, but thank you again for being in the movie, and and, and it was an absolute thrill to work with you for those five minutes. Well, thank you for having me. I, <laughs> minute of it it was super fun and so i can't how, wait to see your finished movie so how did you get into the film uh to, into the movie in the uh, how did you get into the business in the first place so i moved to la in two th- uh, end of 2001 to be an actor mm-hmm. and the first audition i had when i got to la was for the room no <laughs> yes the very first audition i responded to an ad in backstage west and, you know, sent my headshot in. Uh, they called Greg Sestero was doing the casting, uh-huh. who ends up playing Tommy's best friend in the movie. So he called me and I went to the set, auditioned. And so that was the first, you know, movie I was in when I got to L.A. So literally off the turnip truck, you get straight <laughs> to the room <laughs> casting. Please. What are the odds? I mean, I mean, like that's like the first thing off. The, literally, you get off the bus. It's like, oh, let's just go over to the room. The most, obs- <laughs> the craziest experience of your life. You literally, the timing well, couldn't have been better. I was or, from or worse, I'm, depending how you look at it. I know it could not have. It's it's really like a combination of the two, both both best and worst thing to ever happen. Now, what was the <laughs> casting process like for the room? <laughs> It was insane. I mean, if if you've seen the movie The Disaster Artist, they capture it pretty well. Okay. Um, I came to the set. Uh, it was broad, broad daylight. It was – there were a ton of people there. And Tommy had us stand in front of a camera and he was like, okay, now your best friend just died. Go. And then he'd want you to be like, <laughs> oh, my God, and wailing with tears. And then 30 seconds later, he'd say, you just won the lottery. Go. And then you're supposed to be like, oh, my God. And then if you didn't switch on a dime, he'd be like, what's wrong with you? Your best friend died. You have no, you have no heart, you know, and that's how it went. So it was a miracle that anybody got cast and that I I don't know. I mean, I think I got cast because I showed up first to the audition. I was the first one there and I talked to Tommy Uh one-on-one and he just asked me a bunch of questions about myself. And then I, at the end of the conversation, he was like, okay, I think I cast you. And I'm like, um, oh, do you want me to audition or? So you didn't audition. I actually did. I did audition. So I, you know, more people showed up and then I did the standard audition with everybody else. I read the chocolate is a symbol of love scene with Greg Ellery, who ends up playing Steven. And then I did the whole chicken, you know, what uh, act like a chicken. That's one of the things I throw in that Tommy said, um, your best friend just died. You won the lottery, act like a chicken. And so I did all that. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so I did audition, but I, but I'm still convinced that the actual reason I got it was because I was the first one there. So, I mean, this is your, this is your first big Hollywood audition. Um, and I use that term very loosely, um, very, very loosely. You have no other auditions to kind of refer back to. So I mean, I lived in Chicago and I'd auditioned there, right. but yeah, none in LA. Right. So no LA auditions to, for you to kind of go back to how many people on the, uh, as far as the cast were concerned, were kind of newbies in the sense, like have maybe done one thing or two, but you know, didn't seem that anybody was like super, super seasoned other than the every, mother, except I think. Oh yeah. The mother maybe, but every last person was super new. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> you, had to you know, it, I think to agree to do the room, you, you probably had you, to be pretty naive. I, I I just thought no one would ever see it. I knew it was bad. <laughs> oh, so you knew, thought, so you went, no one you, will ever see it. Did you read it? Was there a script? 
No, he wouldn't show us the script. There was a script, but he would not show it to the actors because, quote, I quote Tommy, you're just going to try to steal it. Mm. So he, he thought we were going to steal it. And so he wouldn't share the whole script. So we'd get like three pages and then he'd say, OK, you're going to shoot these three pages tomorrow. And we'd get it a lot of the day of, or maybe the day before. And we'd have to just memorize those lines. And I never knew where the scene fell in the context of the entire movie or the narrative. Mm-hmm. Had no yeah. idea what, you know, which move, which scene came first, which scene came second. Like, that's which, why it was so hard to give any kind of arc, character arc or anything. Which is which is interesting because now that makes so much more sense when you watch The Room because there doesn't seem to be like a beginning, middle or arc or anything. It's just like you have you you as actors have no idea what's going on. You just exactly. kind of thrown into a scene and like act like what <laughs> happened before? Did I, did I get shot before? Did, did my mother die before? Like what, what's, and that's every scene is like that, which yeah. you have to yeah. argue is quite genius if that's what you're going for. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going for total confusion on the part of the actors and characters in every scene. And also just- crew as well. And everybody else as well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, how was how was the crew while you were um, working, and how many, and how, how long were you actually on on the on the set, meaning you know, shooting on production? I was there for a few weeks. Um, I came in. I was a mid season replacement. Um, Juliet, who plays Lisa, was originally Michelle, mm-hmm. and the first three Lisas quit. And I then, wonder why. I know. Surprise, surprise. I think it was when they realized they'd have to do a love scene. With Tommy. Right. And they were like, okay, I'm out of here. Um, so yeah. And then, so Lisa was playing Michelle. She moved to Lisa and then they needed to fill the Michelle character's spot. Mm-hmm. So that's when they did additional auditions. And that's when I came in and filled in the spot. Oh, so Michelle. they were already shooting. They were already shooting when you yeah. did your audition. Exactly. They had already shot a cup for a couple months. And how long was the final, like, was it six months shooting, a year shooting? How long did they shoot? <laughs> I think it was like six months. Yeah. I remember God. in the Disaster Artist, even, they characterized that. It's like it just kept going. It just kept and going and going. going. And the money, and the money always was there. He just always had the money. Yeah. It was like a bottomless well of money. And there are three different crews. I was when I was there, and I was only there for a few weeks. There were, I think, two, at least two or three crews that that were different crews. They would quit, and then a whole new crew would show up because they would, yeah. <laughs> so they kept quitting. They were a professional crew, and I guess they just got fed up with stuff. Yeah, they were an LA crew. They were an LA crew that was like, uh, okay, we'll deal with this for a day or two, but this is enough. We can't, t- we can't take this anymore. Because exactly. I- I'm assuming it wasn't the most professional set on the planet. No, <laughs> to say you, the, you, that's a good assumption. <laughs> to say the least. And what was Tommy's directing style like? If you can call it uh, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, if you can call it that. Well, let's see. Like for the season with Juliet, where we have that pillow fight. Right. He, I remember. Do you know if you remember that scene? I remember all the scenes. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so we, I had just met her literally like 20 minutes before and um, we're on the set and then, and we're just talking. We're doing this scene. He goes, you don't even seem like you know each other. Are you with, you you're best friends. Why don't you, you have a pillow fight. Girls have pillow fights. That's what girls do. Yes, do. So Juliet and I are like, um, <laughs> yeah, right. That's what we do. We have drink wine and feed each other with pillows. So we just, that you know, that he directed us to do that pillow fight. You probably remember that. Mm-hmm. And um, other than that, a lot of times he was actually in it. And so whenever he was in the scene, it was hard for him to direct. Right. So that's where that whole controversy comes in about the script supervisor, Sandy sure. Sclair, sure. directing it, directing the room, which he would help for sure. He would help Tommy when Tommy was in scenes, like tell Tommy where to go and help with blocking and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, do you want that credit? I know. I don't that, get that. That, that is what I don't get that. That like if you are the – ghost director of the room do you want to be known as the ghost director of the room like i, I yeah it doesn't make sense because i mean everyone can t- I, the reason it's bad and it's because of tommy i mean it's just, oh no the reason why it's good and bad is because of tommy it's it's 100 percent tommy it is good and bad exactly because there's things in it like i mean you just i mean well the first of all obviously all women uh, when they're in their twenties, have pillow fights uh, and drink wine. Obviously, 
Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's my experience. Every last woman. Every last woman. It is it's part of the DNA. <laughs> um so uh, the best example of the best explanation of Tommy ever is as a director I've heard was imagine an alien comes down to earth, takes <laughs> over a body and then this is the movie it thinks <laughs> that would be a movie that other earthlings would enjoy. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's I, and I was thing. like, that's pr- because it's such a look. We've all seen bad movies. We've all <laughs> seen bad movies. I mean, Troll. <laughs> I, I saw Troll 2 and I, I, I think a little bit of my my, my soul left me. <laughs> um, I like the documentary about the Troll 2, Troll 2 which is amazing, uh, much better than the movie. But we've seen bad movies. There have been bad movies throughout history. Ed Wood movies. I mean, uh, forever. But there's something so magical about this movie, and and and, and, mm-hmm. it, and it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint it. But from my analysis, and maybe I'd love to hear what you think, why people react the way they do to it, it's that it is authentically Tommy. There is mm-hmm. nothing bullshit about the movie. He is not trying to be. It's it's what he it's it's authentic. Yeah, it I, fully embodies Tommy. It, and, it just is everything that Tommy is. <laughs> and the authenticity, you can literally come off. Because if I would go to try to direct a, a bad movie, like horribly bad, as you know, you would <laughs> smell it. Like, oh, this is a guy who's just trying to be like a bad movie. We've seen those movies before, like, <laughs> right. like Sharknado. Like, you know, they, they know what they're doing. They know this is a bad movie. They know it's ridiculous. They're just yeah. having fun. It's but, a self-awareness there. But Tommy has absolutely <laughs> no self-awareness. And thought he was making Citizen Kane. Yeah, and that that is you're right. Why it is so magically bad? Because the earn it's so earnest. Yes. And it, he's it, it, there's such an effort to be good. Yes. And it fails so spectacularly that that is deeply. I don't know why it, it sounds sadistic, but that is deeply funny. It is. It, it is. <laughs> it's just it, it. It fails on on so many levels. Like when we were watching yeah. it that night before we shot the scene, uh, everybody was there. Like, why is there another shot of San Francisco? What's going on? Why is that there? Oh my! Like every, all my professional filmmaking friends who had never seen this, they're all sitting there going. After like twenty minutes, they get it. And there's some people in the audience that did not. Get, did it, like this is just horrible. I can't watch this. Yeah, but the people who got it, they jumped on the ride and were just like completely on board. And that's the kind of movie it is. But it, it it's a fascinating a fascinating character study. And I think the disaster artist did a really uh, interesting job with that relationship and with Tommy yeah. and, and and all of that. What did you think of the disaster artist? I really liked it. I thought it was hilarious, and I thought James Franco did a really good job at capturing Tommy. I mean, midway through, I forgot I was even watching James Franco. It, it seemed like Tommy. And um, I, I thought they captured the friendship and the story really well. And it would balance a lot of, you know, humor with pathos and like sincerity. And I thought it was great. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. And then when we were sitting down talking for a few minutes, you said that the disaster artists got a few things that they took some creative license with. What are the things that were kind of different between – the disaster artist and reality. Yeah. The very end when everyone's cheering in the theater at, at the premiere of the room, mm-hmm. that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> that absolutely did not it, 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 the, the, the phenomenon did not start off with a bang. It, it's, it was a slow burn. <laughs> it's a slow burn. I think people obviously cheer now, but at the screenings of the room, but people, I mean, we were, people were laughing Certainly, but it was a try, people trying to contain their laughter right. in the theater because they knew Tommy meant it to be a searing drama, and instead <laughs> it was a laugh out loud comedy. I was sitting two rows or a row behind Tommy, and I was trying so hard to contain my laughter, but it, it, I ended up crying. I was crying with laughter because you know when you try to stop laughing, it gets even worse. Right. And um, so a lot of people were like that. Like we were really trying not to seem like we were laughing, but we all were. And then after that, we, after the movie, we, there was a party and no one was, everyone was just awestruck. Like our jaws were on the floor and we were looking around like, oh my God, what was that? Right. And I didn't approach Tommy because I just knew I couldn't lie believably. Right. And I didn't want to have to, you know, I didn't want to say that was amazing or. Did he feel it? Did he, did he understand that he, that it was not well received or was he still in delusional world? 
the night of yeah i don't know for sure i feel it because i feel like he it didn't go well from his perspective okay okay Okay. Like he must have heard the chuckles. I don't know. He must have. But okay. So in the disaster artist, when he and Greg go to the lobby mm-hmm. and they discuss it and, and, and Greg's character is like, you know, you made something that people aren't enjoying. Listen to them. They're loving it. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. they go back in there and then they, I know I do. I don't believe that that happened that mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. Perhaps it did a week later, a couple of weeks later. Sure. But yeah, it, it took a little while to kind of re, um, re reframe the narrative or re <laughs> <laughs> to yeah, reframe story. the situation in general. <laughs> yeah. What was the reaction of the other actors that you saw? How were there any that were absolutely <clears throat> pissed? Other people that were just could not stop laughing, thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. What are the reactions? Of, and you don't have to use their names, but just what are the reactions of some of the other actors? Some of the other actors were devastated. Oh. Um. And then others were just like, okay, well, we knew it was going to be bad, but this was really, really bad. <laughs> Um, there were, for me, it was a hap- there were so many things that were really f- a happy surprise. Like the things I didn't know were in the room that were so funny, like the rooftop scene. I mean, all of the rooftop scenes, like, but you got, so you basically got the joke right away. I, my husband and I were dying laughing. And then the next morning we woke up and we were quoting lines to each other from the room. And then we were crying with laughter again. I mean, we were just seriously laying there laughing so hard. We were crying. So for me, I was like, well, I don't think anybody will see this, but if they do, it could get a cult following because it is crazy funny. So you, you were, you, so you literally caught that right away. You caught what this could be and you were basically reacting as a room fan right away off the first screening. Yes, because I was in so few of the scenes right. that it, you know, and I was like, oh yeah, my scenes are fine. I wasn't devastated by the scenes I was in. Mm-hmm. They were totally fine. And I thought it, I just enjoyed the rest of it, like how crazy it was and how irrational. So, yeah, I just thought it was hilarious from the I'm, beginning. I mean, I've, and obviously the pillow scene was the, the, the highlight. But uh, yeah. <laughs> and the chocolate scene, of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> put, put, your, put your insults in your pocket. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I can't just – I'm sorry. I can't help it. Um, now, what is the weirdest thing you saw on the set? Um, oh, well, I didn't physically see this, actually see this, but the makeup artists, they had, well, I had to get airbrushed every day because Tommy didn't like freckles and he had got him, he got airbrushed every day as well, his Mm -hmm. entire body. Obviously. (laughs) Obviously, right. Because he's got to look flawless on screen. And, um, the use, the the term flawless is, is, is a, it's a loose word. He used very, (laughs) within a certain range. Yes. (laughs) what's doable yes so this the the day they had to do the butt scene i came Uh, back it was like the next day after they shot the naked butt scene with tommy mm -hmm. and they told button in the belly button you will not the the belly button hump oh they didn't mention that okay i didn't really know about that the recycled sex scene until i saw it on screen right so that was a a treat but um they said you will not believe what happened i said what happened they said yesterday we had to airbrush tommy's butt and then we had to keep touching it up all day long. <laughs> the poor oh makeup artist. Oh my god! That was that was the thing I heard about when I came back to the set. But I, I just you know people quit all the time. Um, there was a documentarian following us around all the time on set, filming us behind the scenes. So literally, we couldn't even change. He would follow us. There wasn't a changing room for the actors. Mm-hmm. There was just a little tent. And so in order to change, we had to duck behind cars in the Burns and Sawyer parking lot. Oh, God. To try to change. And then the documentarian would be following us with his camera, I remember, telling him, like, dude, I'm trying to change here. So, yeah, that it was, yeah, it was oh, great. Very oh, professional. Because obviously, <laughs> as he says, his ass is what's going to sell international. Yes. Yes. Uh, so. oh. <laughs> Does he really well in China. Yeah, he's huge in China. Um, so, and then you—you you obviously kept living in LA. So, when you kept driving by the, the billboard, what was the what was your feeling when you first saw this billboard? 
I was like, that is still up. I can't believe it's still there. Um, it's like three years, right? It was like two to three years that thing was it, up. I think it was might have even been five years. Oh, my God. The money. And, uh, Where's the money coming from? No one no, knows. No one knows. No one still to this day. Nobody knows where the money came so from. For, so for anybody who's listening and doesn't know <laughs> what we're talking about, in L.A. for five years – there was a billboard on – was it like on – I don't even know, I remember what street it was on. It was um, on Island and Fountain. So it's a fairly fairly predominant billboard. Uh, and it was this shot of, of Tommy with the room with his, with his number on it to set up screenings. And it just stayed there. It became like this landmark in LA. And everyone was like, what is this room thing? And I remember when I got here – I got here in 2008 – and when was the room uh, shot? 2000? 2002, and it came out 2003. Right. So by then, it had already been five years. So it already picked up the, the cult following at this point, where I walked into a theater and I saw the poster, like midnight showing of the room. And, every, and, I'm like, and I asked my L.A. friends, like, what's the room? They're like, oh, you've got to see the room. And that's the way the whole thing went, like the whole phenomenon of the room yeah. worldwide is like you have to see the room. Yeah, it was a lot of it was word of mouth. I mean, I think most of it was word of mouth, but because the mouth, the word of mouth was so passionate, and people who saw it loved it so much, it it worked. And now, do you have you? I'm assuming you've gone to some screenings. I'm assuming you've signed an autograph or two. Y- yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is your reaction as going to these screenings? And then have are there have there been any like conventions you've gone to? Like, I mean, sure, comic book conventions or movie conventions or anything like that that you've attended? I haven't gone to any conventions. Um, When I go to the screenings, a lot of times I'll go with a group of friends and we'll dress up. A lot of times I've worn wigs because I like to be a fly on the wall just to see how people react. Um, I've been to a couple screenings in my hometown of North Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's been really fun. And I was on the news there, (laughs) which is crazy. (laughs) That's so awesome. (laughs) Local affiliate. Uh, yeah. Talking about being in the worst movie ever made. Right. Little girl makes good. <laughs> in the worst movie ever made. Right. The worst movie ever made. <laughs> yeah. Great story. One day I'll have something really great I can talk about. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I love going to the screenings. I love meeting the fans and, and, um, just seeing how everyone reacts to it. And I enjoy it. And I feel like I get something new out of it every time I go. And the way you reacted to my actor in, in my movie as a fan of the room, I'm assuming is the way you react to other fans. Like you're so, you were so humble. You were just kind of like, Oh, you're a fan. Oh, great. Oh, you want to talk about Tommy? Sure. I'll talk about Tommy. <laughs> like, I'm sure this is like a daily basis. Do you get recognized on the streets? I mean, sometimes I do, but it, not that much. I, I stay, I mean, I live in West LA and I'm like in my area most of the time. Mm-hmm. And I think if I, when I, I got recognized a couple times at Sundance and then if I'm off in the Hollywood area, I get recognized more. But because I, I think there's just more people there who have seen their room. Sure. And um, so I just not like I get recognized that much. Um, yeah. Now, at what point did you? Because we talked about this a little bit off air. At what point do you accept? what this is and go along for the ride as opposed to fight it. Cause I'm assuming there were some actors who just wanted to have nothing to do with it. I, I, I want my name off of it. I don't want to be involved with this, but you decided to go the other way and like, you know what? Uh, this is fun. I'm going to jump on board. When would, when was that moment in your, in your life? Let's see. 2008 entertainment weekly did a four or five page spread about the room. And <laughs> I was interviewed for that. And I guess it had been slowly gaining some traction up until that point. And people had been telling me about it. I was in film school mentioning, oh, you know what? A lot of celebrities are becoming fans. And, and you know, um, I guess Paul Rudd is a fan and all, you know. Yeah. And I was like, oh, uh-huh. oh it'll, I think it'll just run its course. You know, that's great. But, you know, and then when Entertainment Weekly did the full spread, I was like, oh, crap, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to go it's away. It's growing. It's just you know growing. I mean? <laughs> and um, I think I, I, I was sort of out of film school, not really embracing it that much. It's not, I just really didn't, it's, I didn't really think about it that much because I um, was, you know, I wanted to be taken seriously. And I feel like if you advertise that you're in the worst movie ever made, mm-hmm. it doesn't really necessarily lend itself to people respecting you. It's not good for the branding. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I thought, you know what? 
I'm just going to ignore it. It'll go away. (laughs) And that just did not work. (laughs) And, um, I think I was at a screening in Hollywood and I had a blonde wig on. I was with a bunch of friends. So we were there to have fun. And Michael Sarah was in line behind me okay. and we went up and we started talking to him and he's like, well, why are you in a blonde wig? And I said, Oh, I just like to be a fly on the wall and kind of not, you know, not have people know who I am and stuff. And he's like, why not? You should just really embrace it. I mean, this is one of the most fun things there is to do in LA. I like to come, I, you know, I come here all the time to see the room and, and I was like, his, you know, it's not that I was, I mean, I was obviously there, so I wasn't like hiding from it fully, mm-hmm. but I, that was good advice in terms of embracing it because I realized I cannot, it won't go away. And, um, <laughs> it's I mean, like a really I'm, bad tattoo exactly. <laughs> it's it's on, there. on your face, on your face, <laughs> right there, front and center. It's a Mike Tyson tattoo on your face. You're not getting rid of it. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> So that's why I decided eventually to do the mockumentary because I write comedy and I'd had been a comedy writer for a long time. And, um, and I just had this idea of wouldn't it be funny if these room actors kept trying to escape it and they couldn't, they could not escape the room, which is basically true. And, um, just exaggerate it and poke fun at it and, and have fun with the struggle of these actors trying to escape from being in this, the worst movie ever made and never being able to. So yeah, tell me a little bit about the movie that you're directing. Yeah, so it's a mockumentary uh, web series, and it features all of the actors from the movie The Room, seven out of nine of us, so Tommy and Greg aren't in it. Um, and it basically follows them as they struggle with either embracing or shaking the stigma of appearing in the worst movie ever made. And most of them are trying to shake it, and they can't. Um, so we just see everyone suffering in their own way. Um, like Juliet is married to her, her first stalker and the stalker (laughs) basically stalks her around the house, reenacting scenes from the room. And so that's, that's her life. (laughs) Denny Philip, who plays Denny in the room is working Denny's, um, because it's the only place where he could get hired. And, um, so Denny, people come into Denny's, they recognize him as Denny from the room and they start reciting lines. And then he can't, he like, he t- ends up taking it out on them and he gets fired. And it, um, <laughs> yeah, so every episode features a different, well, the first three episodes feature two room actors. Mm-hmm. And then after that, every episode features one room actor. And, and then are you in one, are you in one of these episodes? Yes. Okay. I'm in episode two. Okay. And, and I'm married. I've been married eight times and I keep getting divorced because every guy I marry does the um, room. O face behind my back. <laughs> 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 which is that face that my boyfriend in the movie makes oh my that's um, right oh God. and i'm assuming they always want to do pillow fights oh yeah yeah that's in my kickstarter campaign got a pillow fight in that so <laughs> so, so you're so you're doing yeah. now is this a web series or is this going to turn into a full-blown document or mockumentary that you'll release as a feature how is it how are you doing it well i have four episodes done now and each one's about eight minutes so it's about 30 minutes of programming that I've already done Mm -hmm. and they're out there. They're on funny or die and they're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then I've got six more episodes written and ready to film. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to raise money for those. Now I'm about to do a Kickstarter campaign um, to get the funds to shoot the remaining six. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be also on funny or dies, Amazon platform soon. I'm just signing contracts with them now. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Um, And yeah, so when it's all said and done, it'll be over 60 minutes of of stuff. So I don't, I don't have plans to edit it together into a feature or anything. Mm -hmm. I think I'll just keep it as the web series because Mm -hmm. there's so many different room actors that kind of fits to just have each episode focusing on one or two of the room actors. And how did you, and how did you get everybody to be on? Because I'm, so everybody embraced this at this point. Yeah, um, I pitched it to Juliet, Kyle, Carolyn, and Greg Sestero when I saw them for uh, a documentary, mini documentary Greg was doing about uh, for the book launch of mm-hmm. the Disaster Artist, mm-hmm. and they were all interested. And you know, so I said, okay, I'll send you my short that I've written. And at the time, it was just a short ten minute movie. Mm-hmm. I sent it to Juliet, and she got back right back to me. She's like, oh my god, I love it. Let's do it. We've got to do it. So she was really encouraging and help as kind of a catalyst for saying, yes, we should definitely do this. Cause I was nervous. I was worried they wouldn't want to make fun of, them, of themselves or sure. cause I have Juliet. She starts out drunk in a bar and right. she's wearing a sexy red dress and she's hunched over like a drink. And I was like, I didn't know if Juliet would want to make oh. fun of 
just, you know, the fact that she was in this movie, but she was totally game and excited about it. And, and what, she, did, what did Greg and, and, and Tommy think about all this? And how come they're not in the movie? So Greg Sestero is super supportive and he couldn't be in it because he had signed a, a non-compete agreement when he um, made the deal with the disaster artist. Oh, okay. this, we shot this way before the disaster artist came out mm-hmm. and, um, and, but he was really supportive. So he signed our poster and some of our Kickstarter rewards and he reposted our, our original Kickstarter campaign and shared it and stuff. But then Tommy, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 Tommy was a didn't he first came to me and he was like, why don't you invite me? I'm like, well, I'm happy to invite you. You know, I'd love to have you. So will you be a part of it? And he was like, well, you have to pay me $250,000. And I'm like, yeah, so that's not going to happen. And um, <laughs> yeah. So then he gave me a hard time about my Kickstarter campaign. He wanted me to blur out the poster. He wanted me to blur out footballs, roses, chocolates, and spoons, all of which were in my Kickstarter campaign because he owns those. What do you mean you know, he owns, owns the rights to spoons? What do you mean he owns the rights to the spoons? Please, no, no, you have to let me know. What does that mean? I'm, I'm just joking. I'm, he, you know, he does own the rights to his movie poster, so I did blur that out. Fair but enough. then after I did that, he, you know, came back and he was like, "Now you blur out the spoons, you blur out the chocolate, you blur out the football, you blur out the roses." You know, I'm like, no. No, you don't have copyright. I was like, he can't have copyrights on those spoons. He can't. No. There's no I mean, way. The spoons is a fan thing anyway. Well, no. He, okay. What, all right. So everybody who's not who has not seen The Room was listening. In the movie, there's framed pictures of spoons. Yeah. For no apparent reason in the movie. Do you know what the reason is that? Do you even have any idea? Has, has anyone ever I mean, heard they about came. Them? They came with the frames, you know, they, they were just the standard photos that came in the frames. And I don't know why anybody would sell because usually you've got yeah, like I was, right, right. I was like, who, who put spoons? <laughs> it like, that's ridiculous. I've never yeah. seen one of those. I've never seen that either other than the room, but it worked out beautifully. Because you know, throughout the movie, there's framed pictures of spoons. So every time the audience sees spoons, they throw plastic spoons at the, uh, at the screen. So for everyone listening. Which is one of the most fun parts of going to a, a room screening is throwing those spoons. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, really fun. I was I was a Rocky Horror Picture Show guy for a long time when I was in high school. I loved going there with the rice and the the toilet paper and all the things that you would throw um, during it. So I'm assuming the room is the new generation of that. That's what a couple journalists have called it. They call it the new Rocky Horror Picture Show. And it's going to live for a, It's not going to go away. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. <laughs> I don't, I don't think so either because, I mean, we, I went to a screening and there was a bus of 15-year-olds that had come from the Inland Empire with their parents at, as a graduation gift to get to ride into Westwood to see a screening of the room. And they have to see it here. This is like Mecca. You have to, yeah. see, you have to see it in Hollywood in order to see it. It, it, it's, it is by far one of the most fascinating Hollywood stories ever. It, it really is. And I do agree with you. I think the disaster artist did it justice. The book was yeah. wonderful. I love the book. I read the book cover to cover. I was just, and as, as I was reading it, I'm like, no, this, no, this, no. <laughs> no. It this, is so funny. This, this couldn't have happened. No. <laughs> and I actually had the pleasure uh, while I was directing uh, some commercials, I hired a sound guy. His name was Zolt. I don't know if you know who Zolt is. No. Zolt was one of the audio engineers on the room. Oh, wow. And it went like wildfire on the set <laughs> that he was the guy who was the sound guy in the room. And we the just, sound is great. <laughs> the sound, fant- it was sound fantastic. And I would just run to him. I'm like, Zolt, first of all, great name, Zolt. Um, secondly, <laughs> is it true? He's like, yes, this is all true. Because <laughs> he has a really <laughs> thick accent. It's all true. He was a maniac. <laughs> it was <laughs> That's what you said. He's a maniac. He was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but it is, but, um, <laughs> so how, um, by the way, since you now worked with all the other actors, how are they doing? What are they doing? Are they, they've kind of, how do they venture off into other things of uh, after the room? Yeah. So, um, Juliet lives in Texas now. She's married and she is, does graphic design, Mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. And let's see, Kyle is still in LA. He plays Peter in the room. He's still here. He does, still does acting. And he has a day job, I think, at either Sony or Disney doing their tech 
some okay. of their tech stuff. And then Dan Janjigian lives in Texas also. He is in, I believe, banking or insurance. Mm-hmm. He seems to be doing pretty well. Um, uh, Philip lives in Arizona. He's a journalist. He just got married like a couple of days ago. Oh, no, like last week. Okay. Um, and then Carolyn is here. She lives in the South Bay and she is an actress still. She mm-hmm. does commercials and print work and things like that. See, Greg Ellery, he just moved from Illinois back to California, and I'm not sure what he's doing. He was a, for a while, he just re- rejected the room. <laughs> he, he was a holdout on my show. He, I had emailed him and he didn't respond about being in it. And I did the Kickstarter campaign without him, but with all the other actors. And finally, um, I heard back from him saying, okay, I'll be in it. <laughs> um, so he ended up being in it. He's awesome. He is a funny, funny guy. So I'm really glad he's in it. And, and then, then who else? And then you yeah. and you now are a doc. You, you're a filmmaker as well as an actress yeah. still. Um, yeah, mainly a writer director and okay. an actress. Um, for I don't send my I don't go out like I was a commercial actress for a long time, mm-hmm. but I decided to focus mainly on writing and directing, and then I'll put myself in stuff or make my own projects. Or if my friends make projects, I'm in theirs. Mm -hmm. But I, like I, I had been in, I was in the room, and then I was right after that, I was in one other bad movie, Um, and I'd been (laughs) in some good movies and some good shorts too. But I thought, like, especially some in Chicago, and then some out here too. They went to great festivals. But after I was in those two bad movies, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do another bad movie. I'm not going to do a movie until I know for sure that it's gr- that's good, you know. Right, right. And then I went to right after that decision. I went to film school at UCLA and in, in not a bad film school. Not a got, bad film school to go to. No, I loved it. Loved it. and studied screenwriting. Got an MFA in screenwriting, and then was focusing on writing. And then just recently started directing. And um, now I'm in a phase where I'm just kind of making a ton of things that I write myself and then I make and then I put myself in them. I'm not necessarily the main character, but I throw myself in wherever. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Now, you were uh, were also in another documentary called Room Full of Spoons. Can you talk a little bit about that doc and the controversy behind it? Yes. Um, So that was filmed so long. I think I filmed my part in that in 2013. That's five years so um, that's been in the works for a while. And, um, you know, he used to have a good relationship with Tommy. Um, his name is Rick Harper, the mm-hmm. director of mm-hmm. that. And um, then it's just they had a falling out and Tommy got mad. And and so then Tommy has been very upset about the film, which is a documentary and uh, looking at the making of the room and Tommy's background and where Tommy is from and how Tommy got his money and um, all of this stuff. They even go to Europe. They go to Eastern Europe, Poland, where Tommy is from, mm-hmm. and they interview his family members. Oh, they found his family. Yes. Oh yeah. no! No wonder he's losing his mind. So he was really mad about that, and um, he tried. He, he got a court injunction to shut down, prevent the release of that movie. Tommy did. So the movie and, never got released. Um, well, apparently the court injunction was lifted. I thought it was back in December. Rick made an announcement on his Facebook page that it had been lifted, but that there were some, still some legal issues in the way, and I don't think it's been released yet. I know he was going to play at a couple of festivals, and Tommy stopped those from happening. Um, wow. So, yeah, I was really worried for a while Tommy was going to try to do that with my show, but he hasn't at all. Like, I haven't heard from Tommy at all since that kickstarter campaign i did back in 2014 so he's been totally fine with my luckily with my show luckily because um, you don't want it's kind of like do you want to hear from tommy or you don't want to hear from tommy <laughs> it's like i mean yeah i tommy's if if i heard from tommy and he were nice i would be happy to hear from tommy sure i just didn't want to hear any threats from tommy which he had been when i first did the kickstarter he was threatening me a little bit um, right so, yeah, like the thing about blurring all this stuff out and then, you know, I will try to take you down from Kickstarter and stuff like that. And and I kept saying, look, this isn't about you. It has nothing to do with you. It's about the room actors and what they're doing now. And I think once my show came out, he realized that. And he, right. I literally haven't heard a peep. Right, because him. you're also not or, making – you're not – you're you're kind of making fun of it, but you're kind of fi- – you're filling – you're, you're um, uh, putting gasoline on the fire of the mythos of r- the room. With this movie, you're not kind of trying to go after him personally. Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, making fun of all the rest of us. And sure, yeah, there's room jokes. There's a ton of room jokes, but they're designed for room fans. But it's not targeted at Tommy and his background or anything like that. That's it's it's been an adventure, and and it's an adventure that will be with you for a while. It's it, and I, um I, I don't even know if something like this happened to me. I don't even know how I would have reacted. So I'm <laughs> I, I'm I'm so thankful that you came on the show to talk about uh the inside <laughs> the inside scoop on the room and. And your project. Yeah. Now, where can, by the way, where can people support your project? Um, I'm about to launch another Kickstarter campaign, and I'll give you the link so that when you air this, hopefully it will have launched. Uh-huh. And that's going to be in a few weeks. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the link. If you have the link, you could say it, but I'll put it in the show notes in either way. And I'll also, if you want to watch the show, if you haven't seen it yet, you can go to YouTube um, forward slash Robin Paris, and you can watch the whole show there or funny or die forward slash Robin Paris. Is it okay if I put those in the show notes as well? I could just actually put the clips there so they can yeah. watch the whole thing. That'd be great. Yeah, That'd absolutely. Be great. absolutely. So if you guys want to watch, uh, the first four episodes, uh, it'll be in the show notes as well. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask all of my guests. Okay. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Obviously not to, to go for a casting at the room, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> first thing you do is you try to appear in the worst possible movie, movie. You can find. right exactly the, the worst that will become a cult favorite and will will live on in infamy for the rest of eternity go ahead your life exactly. <laughs> that's the first thing you do <laughs> second um, second well i guess i would say use what you have in a way because as a writer you know they say write what you know which to some extent is good for me, I, I've been writing about all kinds of things or all kinds of comedy. But f- what gave me a chance to direct, um, and I found that I love directing and I want to keep doing it every chance I can get, was taking something that happened in my life and making it funny, something that I actually struggled with, like being in the room and make trying to make it work for me. Yeah. So I would say if you're a filmmaker and you want to get something off the ground, think about what you have to offer in your specific life. Like what have you lived that you could either poke fun of if you're, if you do comedy or that you could actually just, you know, if you're in drama that you could bring to life and show a dramatic moment in your life, um, you know, write a short, write, write something that you can pull from your own life. And then, and then when you either do a crowdfunding, you can speak from personal experience. You can say, this is why I'm doing this. And you have like a, a real passion for, for the reason, you know, your motivation for why you're doing it. Um, and I think people will respond to that and will help you, will help you by being on your crew or giving you some money through crowdfunding or your, you know, family, because it's something they know you care about. Mm-hmm. And I guess I would just say, just do it because I think there's a lot of fear involved with putting yourself out there and kind of just taking a step in a direction you've never gone before. And I think just for me, I faced a lot of fear with when I did this project, just are people going to think this is stupid or are they just going to be like, Oh, you're just an actor from the room. Like, what do you think you <laughs> could do this? You know? Right. But I think you have to face that fear. You really have to, and the way you can face it is by just taking a step in, in the direction every day to face it. Right, and at the end of the day, you you have to you have to walk your own path and not pay attention to what other people think or other or be be free of the good opinion of others, as they say, in many yeah. ways. Yeah, a hundred percent. Don't trust yourself. If you think something is great and you know you can make it great, believe in that. I mean, it worked for Tommy. <laughs> you know what? It is weird because it did. It did. No, he got everything he wanted. I mean, he literally got everything he wanted. He did. He wanted yeah. to be worldwide famous. He wanted to be taken seriously by Hollywood, which in in a, in, in a kind of way he did with the Golden Globes. You know, uh, he almost got it for the Oscars as well. But um, and he did. It was it was nominated for best screenplay. Um, yeah, for so, an Oscar. And now he was in these other two movies, Best Friends, Part 1 and Part 2, uh-huh. which he's getting decent reviews for. People are saying, Tommy's actually good in this. <laughs> they, if well, there's uh, a role written for him, he's really good. Right. So Don't, he, he can't stretch. But if you, if, you right. hit, if you hit it down the middle with Tommy, you're going to get something good. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine exactly. what it's like working with him on set, like as a director, trying to direct Tommy was so... Oh my gosh! You could try. You could hire him. <laughs> oh, I'm sure two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, <laughs> he show right. up anywhere. Two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. That's my really bad Tommy impression. Um, <laughs> Mine is mine's horrible too. <laughs> can you uh, tell me what book 
had the biggest impact on your life or career? Life or career? Wow. Um, let's see. I really love this. Is so like you know school literature AP class or something. But I really love The Great Gatsby. It's a great book. I loved it, and I read it a couple times. I don't think I fully got it when I was younger and I read it. And then I read it later as an adult. And I guess what I like is the striving and the desire to be more than you are, because that's what I find relatable. And I just feel like for me, like, I mean, I came to Hollywood. I was, I had dreams of I'm going to be in the filmmaking industry and I had no connections. I mean, mm-hmm. my dad's a dentist, like I, no, my parents are all back in North Carolina and nobody knows, we know, we know nobody, you know? Right. And I kind of just felt like, uh, with the great Gadsby, Jay Gadsby, that, that character of just trying to kind of come to some place where you don't really fit and trying to make a name for yourself. That was relatable to me. And, and it's kind of a, sad you know but but like and hopefully that's not you know it's for me my life I think is good and you know things are going great and I'm really excited but there's something about how how challenging I think it is in Hollywood to kind of make your way sometimes it's extremely challenging it it, it really is but you have to keep like like Gatsby you have to keep uh striving yeah you have to keep striving no matter what and uh just just keep hustling as i say all the time got to keep that hustle going without question yeah totally totally and i think things are going to work out better than they did in the book (laughs) (laughs) exactly (laughs) that's sort of a downer (laughs) (laughs) and if that's a spoiler alert guys i'm sorry the book's been out for a little bit so that's that's on you right um and there's been a few movies as well um oh sorry uh, that was cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, um, yeah, I think in life, I guess the film business too. Um, not worrying about what people think, and we touched upon that mm-hmm. before, and also not feeling that I. I think I should have tried directing earlier, but I always thought I, that no one will list like no one will listen to me. I thought, how, why would they listen to me? Why would a whole crew of people? <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I get, you have no idea how much I get that from, from people who contact me. They're like, how, how do you handle like a group of people? I'm like, I go, I go either if it's a guy or a girl, I go, guys, you've got to be able to control, you know, not control, but take command of, of, of the army of your, of your, of your squad. Cause if you don't, uh, though you won't be able to make it. And unfortunately you picked a career that takes a group effort to make. Mm-hmm. It's not painting. It's not, you know, writing a song in a guitar. It, it's, it's a very expensive, <laughs> very collaborative art form. Correct. Yeah, correct. And you, if you don't believe in yourself, yeah. then it's very hard, I think, to command a, the respect of a crew. And for me, it took me a while to get there. And now I feel like I'm fully there. Like I totally believe in myself. But, sure. and I think I had kids also. And I think having kids and like mm-hmm. telling everybody what to do all the time <laughs> <laughs> it was just helpful for me to just learn how to treat. Like I, I kind of feel like a crew is maybe it also took me getting older. Yes, and, and 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 I think you just get maturity when you when you get older and you you know how to handle things better. But I feel like I treat a crew not in a condescending way, but kind of like you know we're all family. We're a family on a set, and yes. we need to all collaborate and listen and work together well and respect each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but the respect each other is really important, and that means no attitudes, mm-hmm. no com- tons of no complaining. That kind of thing. I don't like. I would. I just don't tolerate that. You know. So if, um, some, so if an actor comes up and goes, "Pay me two hundred fifty thousand dollars," you don't. <laughs> you, you, that's not working. <laughs> right. Yes. That's just not going to fly. You know. It <laughs> happens all the time. Right. <laughs> um, now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Obviously, besides uh, the room. Okay. Yeah. Besides the room, because that's a given, right? Right. Uh, Back to the Future is my all-time favorite movie. I love that movie. I love that movie. Yeah. I love the trilogy. I love the trilogy in general. Yeah, me too. I love the third one also a ton. Um, E.T., I don't know, I just, uh, it's so great. Mm-hmm. Um, and, well, so I have a lot of comedies that I like. Um, but one of the very first comedies I ever saw 
um, and I just like made me want to be a screenwriter, I think, was Tootsie or just made me want to be in entertainment. Sure. Tootsie. I just, I love, and I love cross-dressing movies. <laughs> like, I love Mrs. Doubtfire too. Mrs. Doubtfire, Some Like It Hot. I'm like, oh, I love Some Like It Hot. The first script I ever wrote, the first feature I ever wrote was these, were these two women who dress as male talent managers, two struggling actresses who dress as male talent managers in order to manage their own careers. <laughs> That's, I did, there was, I, I, that sounds familiar. There was a movie that did, was it? I don't know if it was a, a gag or something. I remember something like that. Not too, but like maybe an episode of Friends. Who knows? Uh- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but you so, rarely see women dressed as men in movies. No, you it's don't. Like, no. It, around. Right. Ex- generally, it's always the other way around. Uh, but uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert and um, Tu Wong Fu. But, oh, I haven't seen Tu Wong Fu. Okay. Oh, you have to I watch Tu Wong Fu. As I'm laying out all the cross-dressing movies of the last 50 <laughs> years, my audience is like, Alex, I had no idea. You have like, I just know them. I just, you just know them. I just know them. Don't ask why. Yeah, you're uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> now, where can people uh, find you in your work? Okay. Oh, yeah. So um, RobinParis.com and Robin's with a Y. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, my, the RoomMockumentary.com is where I have information about the show. And then I'm at Robin O. Paris on Twitter and at Robin O. Paris on Instagram and official Robin Paris on Facebook. If you want to like me there or whatever, follow or um, <laughs> all that stuff, you know, <laughs> I know it's weird. It's weird. It's, I know it people, is weird. It's, it's weird. weird. It's been like, can I tweet you? I'm like, I, I can't stand doing it. I can't stand when anyone says, can I tweet? Like, it, I'm a grown adult. <laughs> I'm a grown adult and I'm saying tweet. I know it's just it's tweet, tweet, tweet. It's like it the weirdest yeah. thing for me still, but I get it. It's the world that we live in today. Robin, mm-hmm. it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you and and thank you so much for being so honest and uh raw about your experience uh in on, honestly the best movie ever made. Uh <laughs> without you. question thank and you. and the pillow scene alone is uh is worth the price of admission it, for anybody. That's right. That's right. It's a classic. <laughs> It's a Thank no. you so much, Robin. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Alex. I really appreciate it too. I want to thank Robin again for coming on and and just just being so kind with her time and talking about the room again that she's probably talked about that movie just in nauseum for the last ten years. So, Robin, thank you so much for being on. And guys, if you are fans of the room, you've got to watch her mockumentary series. I have two episodes on the in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 244 to finished episodes so you can watch what she does, what she did, and and hopefully help her with her Kickstarter campaign to finish off the series. It's super fun, and if you're a fan of The Room, you've got to watch it. So thanks again, Robin. And if you haven't already, guys, head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really, really does help us out a lot. Just do it on your iPhone. Do it uh, on your computer, on your laptop, on your iPad, wherever you can get to. Uh, the show, please just leave us a good review and five stars would be really, really helpful and help us be found by more and more filmmakers so this information can get out to them. And as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. I did not hear her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com. 